So now we're going to build on what we learned in the previous lecture uh, about probabilistic reasoning, and we're and we're going to learn about a new tool that helps quite a lot in solving uh, different problems that arise in prob in probabilistic reasoning. Um, So first, let us review the notion of models and probabilistic models. Remember that models describe how the world or some part of the world works. However, models are always simplifications. They are always abstractions. Um, models may not account for every variable. So for example, uh, when we think about coin toss and the outcome of a coin toss, we can account for the air pressure, we can account for the uh, torque and the force vector of the flipping action, we can think about air friction, we can think about the electromagnetic field in the room, but we, for the sake of simplicity, for us to be able to gain some useful insights uh, into the outcome of a coin flip, we don't necessarily take all of those parameters into account. We simplify uh, the coin toss problem, the settings of coin toss, by reducing the number of variables and parameters that it accounts for. And it may also not account for, the in, for all interactions between variables. Now, does this mean that all mod models are wrong? Yes, all models are inaccurate, but some are useful. This is a quote from George Box, and this is one of the quotes that motivates half of my uh, research work. This is really important to keep in mind. When you get to the... Uh, machine learning modules, we'll be talking about models in an abstract way, or even today we are talking about probabilistic models. It's important to note that all models are simplifications, but our aim is to satisfy some objective uh, requirements or some practical goal with those models. We want to get enough sufficient accuracy out of our models for a particular purpose. Now, what do we do with prob probabilistic models? What can we do with probabilistic models? We, or our agents, can use probabilistic models to reason about unknown variables given evidence, like medical diagnosis. Uh, for example, uh, an example is an explanation why does the patient have headaches or a stiff neck? This is, I'm threading on, um, I'm hanging by a very thin thread when I say this is like causal uh, reasoning. You're trying to find the cause of something, but it's not necessarily just causal. It can just be uh, a general uh, relationship between uh, two events, right? Uh, it can be prediction, like it's raining, is, am I going to be late to work or not? Or it can also help us to measure the value of information, like uh, figuring out whether uh, knowing the air pressure helps us get a better insight uh, into uh, the outcome of coin flips. We aren't going to talk about the last part uh, in this lecture, as far as I remember. We'll get to it later on, uh, but we're going to focus on the first two, explanation and prediction in probabilistic models. Before getting into the 
technical details of uh, how you're going to do this, I need to introduce a new concept in probabilistic reasoning. It's, and it's a concept of independence. Two variables, two random variables, uh, are called independent if for each assignment of those variables, uh, the joint probability of those assignments is equal to the individual probabilities, the multiplication of the individual probabilities of those assignments or those outcomes. So it means that the probability of X and Y happening at the same time is just the probability of X happening and uh, multiplied by the probability of Y happening. This says that their joint distribution factors into a product of two simpler distributions. Another way of writing this definition or formulating this definition is through, con through uh, conditional probabilities. Two variables are independent if for all of their possible outcomes or assignments, the probability of X condition on Y is just the probability of X. It means that the probability of X occurring has nothing to do with the probability of Y occurring. And we denote this independence using this symbol here. So this, uh, this symbol means that X and Y are independent variables. Okay. It's very important to note that independence is a simplifying uh, modeling assumption. In, in the real world, it's highly unlikely that uh, the actual joint, uh, joint distributions uh, measured empirically be independent. However, they can be very close to independent. Why is this? Any thoughts on this? Why is it very unlikely for real joint distributions to show independence? All right, I'm going to give you a hint and then I hope that uh, it motivates you to look further into a new field of science. Our world is a complex system. I've already talked about complex systems briefly. A complex system is comprised of uh, smaller components or subsystems that all interact with each other and their local interactions result in global changes. Think about the butterfly effect. A butterfly flapping its wings in China can start a sequence of events resulting in a tornado in Texas, right? This may sound science fiction, but it's the essence of the field of complex systems. Since our real world is a complex system, it's highly unlikely that our empirical measures of joint distributions for different variables come to be, uh, come to point to absolute independence because all things have some relationship with each other. As I mentioned in a complex system, any interaction, any local interaction can affect any other, uh, all other components in the system. So, uh, finding absolute independence in the real world is very difficult. But 
we, for, for the sake of modeling and uh, simplifying assumptions for modeling, when the independence is weak or when there is a very, very low correlation between two uh, outcomes, we can assume those, the corresponding variables to be independent. Let's look at an example. What could we assume for the variables weather, traffic, cavity, and toothache? So we can probably say that weather and traffic are related to each other. We can also say that cavity and toothache are related to each other. What about traffic and cavity? Well, there may be some cosmic relationship between the two. So some traffic somewhere in New Haven may have started a sequence of events resulting in you having a dental cavity, but the effect of uh, traffic on you getting a cavity can often be insignificant. It can be very, very small in terms of measurable uh, impact. The same goes with toothache and traffic. So you can assume that traffic and toothache and traffic and cavity are independent variables. So let's look at another example. Uh, assume that we have N fair and independent coin flips. Each coin flip, the outcome, the, uh, outcome of each coin flip is represented with uh, a variable xi. So x1 is the uh, first coin flip, x2 is the second coin flip, and so on. By definition, these coin flips are independent of each other. So the joint probability distribution of these coin flips is just their multiplication, right? What's the probability of, let's say we have, let's say n is four, what would be the probability of heads, heads, tails, heads? Since this is, since we assume these variables are independent, then we can use this factorization here. The probability of the, out, the joint probability of these outcomes, head, head, tail, head, is just the probability of head multiplied by the probability of head multiplied by the probability of tails multiplied by the probability of heads. As simple as this. Now, I'm going to introduce a new concept called conditional independence. Consider uh, the settings of a dentist who uses a probe to catch a cavity. There are three, we introduce three variables here whether or not you have a toothache, whether or not you have a cavity, and whether or not the sensor or the probe catches that cavity or finds that cavity. Okay, if I have a cavity, the probability that the probe catches, catches it doesn't depend on whether I have a toothache or not, right? How can we represent this? We can, represent this using conditional probabilities. The probability of plus catch, a positive catch, conditioned on toothache being present, having a toothache and having a cavity is the same as the probability of catching the cavity conditioned on having an actual cavity or the existence of cavity. It means that toothache doesn't play a major, any role in whether or not the probe catches the cavity or not. Okay, 
The same independence holds if I don't have a cavity. P of, uh, and we can represent this as P of successfully catching the cavity condition on having a toothache and not having a cavity is the same as the probability of catching the, uh, catching the cavity condition on not having the cavity. So this plus toothache doesn't really play any role in finding this conditional probability. Okay, catch, the variable catch can be said to, uh, can be said to be conditionally independent of toothache given cavity. So you can say the variable catch is conditionally independent from toothache given cavity. All right. So it means that if you have the outcome of cavity or if you have the evidence of cavity, you don't need to know anything about toothache to calculate the probability of catching the cavity. That's the definition of conditional independence. Now, there are some equivalent statements. You can say the probability of toothache given catch or cavity is equal to the probability of toothache given cavity. So since catch and uh, toothache are conditionally independent, it goes the other way as well. The probability of toothache and catch condition on cavity is the same as the probability of toothache given cavity multiplied by the probability of catch given cavity because catching doesn't have much to do with toothache. One can be derived from the other easily. Now, unconditional and ap or absolute independence is very rare for the reasons we discussed in uh, just a couple of slides ago. Conditional independence is our most basic and robust form of knowledge about uncertain environments. Why? Well, let's look at this. X is conditionally independent of Y given Z. What does this mean? This holds true if and only if for any assignment, for any outcome for these variables, the probability of X and Y condition on Z be equal to the probability of X condition on Z multiplied by the probability of Y condition on Z. Or equivalently, if and only if the probability of X given or condition on Z and Y be equal to the probability of X given Z. All right. Any questions so far? Let's quickly go work through an example. What about the, this domain here? Traffic, umbrella, and raining. So if it's raining, I carry an umbrella or I open my umbrella. If it's not raining, I don't open my umbrella. Is there any relationship between traffic and umbrella? There can be, for some weird reason, there can be some relationship between traffic and umbrella. For example, since there's traffic, you decided to walk home and hence you have to use your umbrella, right? But you can, you can say that umbrella, I'm going to represent this as you, the probability of umbrella conditioned on traffic and raining is just the same as the probability of umbrella given rain. So in this setting, the probability uh, or the variable umbrella 
is conditionally independent of traffic, given that we want to, given that we have access to whether it's raining or not. Does this make sense? Any questions? Okay. Now here's another example that you can work through yourselves. Now there is a very interesting application of the chain rule in conditional independence. Remember the chain rule, P of x1, x2, and xn, the joint probability distribution of these variables could have been noted as P of x1 multiplied by P of x2 conditioned on x1 multiplied by P of x3 condition on x1, x2, and so on. Now, this allows us to trivially decompose the setting of uh, the joint probability distribution of traffic, rain, and umbrella as the probability of rain multiplied by probability of traffic given rain multiplied by the probability of umbrella given rain and traffic. However, with the assumption of conditional independence, it becomes, it can be simplified to the probability of rain multiplied by the probability of traffic given rain multiplied by the probability of umbrella given rain, right? So here's where things get interesting. Bayes nets or in general graphical models, graphical probabilistic models help us express conditional independence assumptions. So Bayes nets, the topic of today's class and uh, next week, is are tools that help us express and compute through conditional independence assumptions. How? Let's see. Um, do you remember the settings of Ghostbusters? Let's apply the chain rule over Ghostbusters. Remember, we have each sensor depends only on where the ghost is. That means the two sensors are conditioned, two sensors are conditionally independent given the ghost position. Now, let's represent a scenario with three variables. T represents whether the top square is red or not. B represents whether the bottom square is red or not. G represents whether the ghost is in the top uh, square or not. Given what's given to us, we know the probability of plus g is 0.5, the probability of minus g is 0.5. This, is, this means that we know with probability 50% that the ghost can be in the top square. We also know the conditional probabilities, the probability of the top squared being red, given the ghost being in the top square, that is 0.8, and so on. Okay, now if we want to find this joint probability distribution TBG, we can apply the independence assumption, the conditional independence assumption, and simplify this to just P of G multiplied by P of T conditioned on G, P of the top squared being uh, red conditioned on G, uh, multiplied by the probability of the bottom squared being where the ghost uh, being red conditioned on G. And we can just, uh, craft a table of uh, P, the joint distribution table using this assumption and what we already know. Okay. But let's look at the big picture. There are two problems with using full joint distribution tables as our, prob as our probabilistic models. If we have more than just a few variables, the joint probability distribution table 
is going to be way too big to represent explicitly. It's also going to be very hard to learn, or in other words, just think estimate instead of learn, anything empirically about more than a few variables at a time. This is because of the computational cost. And because the table, the lookup table is just too huge. Basenets are a solution or a technique for describing complex joint distributions, in other words, probabilistic models. A, model, a probabilistic model is just a joint probability distribution using simple local distributions or conditional probabilities. More proper, a more proper, proper name for base nets is graphical models. So if you hear graphical models in the context of machine learning and AI, you're just talking about base nets. Uh, in base nets, we describe how variables interact locally and how local interactions chain together to give global indirect interactions. For about the next five or 10 minutes, we'll be vague about how these interactions are specified. So just bear with me for now. Let's look at a quick example. This is a base net representing the probability of, let's say, a car accident calculated from the point of view, on, point of, view of an insurance company. So as you can see, this is a very, very complex uh, network of interactions. But if you just look at what you're interested in, the probability of an accident occurring, you want to see how likely it is for your customer to get into an accident so that you can adjust the price of insurance accordingly. If you look at this, you'll see that the occurrence of accidents is directly dependent on only a few parameters, such as the quality of driving, whether or not the uh, brakes come with the anti-lock technology, what's the mileage of the vehicle, or let's say, what's the value of the vehicle, and so on. So if you know the probability distributions for these local interactions, you can easily reason about accidents whether or not an accident is likely or how likely an accident is. Let's look at, for example, uh, the anti-lock uh, note here. Whether or not the car has anti-lock only depends on the make and model of the car, right? And so on. You can see how, you, how we can look at only local interactions to begin reasoning about certain outcomes and certain probabilities. Let's look at a simpler example. So this is a base net for reasoning about why a car is uh, broken or something has gone wrong in a car. This network here, this base net here, knows a lot more than I do about cars and diagnosing, diagnosing uh, issues in cars. Let's see how it works. First look at, let's start from oil light, oil light. The oil light on your dashboard is on. What could have caused this? Well, two things only. There can be no oil, or it, can, it could have been caused by a battery going flat, uh, the car battery dying. What could have caused this, the battery issue? It could have been caused by not having charged the battery, or the battery being full on dead. You need to replace it. Now, what could have caused the battery not being charged. It could have been because 
the alternator is broken or the fan belt is broken and so on. You can keep uh, going, uh, you can use this to do a quick, to run a quick diagnostic of why you are seeing a certain, sim a certain symptom of car problems. Now, to make it more formal, graphical models are represented with, first of all, nodes, which correspond to variables. And of course, you need, uh, as well as their domains. These variables can be assigned, in other words, they can be observed or unassigned or unobserved. All right, so far, let's say we have a variable weather, which interacts with something. How do we represent interactions in graphical models with arcs or edges? It's a graph, right? That's why we call it a graphical model. It's very similar to CSP constraints. An arc indicates direct influence between variables. Formally, an arc or an edge in a graphical model encodes conditional independence. So let's look at this example here. This is a base net, three variables, cavity, toothache, and catch. You can see that uh, the edge, the directional edge here means that toothache is dependent on cavity. You can think of this for now. The, you can imagine that these arrows mean direct causation, but it's a risky assumption. In general, these arrows don't necessarily imply causation, uh, but they can imply very high correlation instead of causation. For now, we'll assume uh, these imply causation to simplify our interpretation. And then when we get to naive Bayes, we'll, uh, we'll reiterate this issue. Let's look at a quick example. We have N independent coin flips and there are no, inter no interactions between variables. We assume that they are fully independent. So we are assuming absolute independence. How can we represent uh, this setting or the joint probability distribution with graphical models like this. A set of nodes, n nodes, corresponding to variables x1 to xn. And since all variables are absolutely independent, there are no edges or no arrows between these variables. All right, this wasn't very interesting. Let's look at a more interesting example. Uh, we have two variables whether or not it's raining and whether or not there's traffic represented by R and T, we can first model uh, the joint probability distribution assuming absolute independence, which doesn't help us much, or we can represent this through a graph, through a BaseNet representation where the rain is seen to be the cause of traffic. There is conditional dependence between traffic and rain represented with this edge. Why is an agent using model two better? Well, I want you to think about this, and I'm going to give you the answer in the coming slides. Let's build a causal graphical model. Here's the setting. There, are, there may be rain or not. There may be a, there may be traffic or not. There can be low air pressure there can be a leak in the roof or the roof may drip or not. There may be a ball game or not. There can be a cavity in your tooth or not. So how do we construct this? Let's start from 
the very beginning. Trap, we first represent the variable traffic. Let me see. The variable traffic as a node. This is, and then we have another variable, rain. Is there any relationship between rain and traffic? Well, it can, there can be, and we can represent this relationship with an arrow or an edge, a directional edge going from rain to traffic and so on. I have to uh, leave the rest of this to you. This is an interesting thought experiment to go through to figure out whether there is a relationship between having a tooth cavity and whether or not the roof is dripping or not. And here's another example that I won't be able to go through. But let's come back to the semantics of base nets. A base net is composed of a set of nodes, one per each variable x. It's a directed acyclic graph. So the edges are directional in this graph, and there are no cycles in this graph. And, it, and each node comes with a conditional distribution, which is essentially a collection of distributions over x, one for each combination of the parents' values. So if you open up this node x, inside you will find a conditional distribution of this variable x over its parents. It, uh, over uh, the parents, parent nodes directly connected to the variable x. Um, and these are typically represented as a conditional probability table. So for each assignment of, for each assignment for these variables, we will uh, have a row in that table. And we call the table conditional probability table or CPT in short which is essentially a description of a noisy causal process. In general, a base net provides us with a description of a noisy causal process. It's important to note that the base net is not just the graph. It's also the, it also includes the local conditional probabilities. Remember, so you have the topology or the graph showing the nodes and the relationship between nodes. And if you open each node, you will find the CPT table for that particular node. Um, let me see. I have only four more slides to go through. I hope that you can bear with me for five more minutes past the end of the class. How do we represent probabilities in base nets? Base nets implicitly encode joint distributions. How? They encode joint distributions as a product of local conditional distributions. To see what the probability, to see what probability a base net gives to a full assignment, all we have to do is to multiply all the relevant conditionals together. So if you want to find the joint probability distribution of this particular assignment to all variables, all we have to do is to find the corresponding value of, for example, this assignment in the CPT table of the second variable. Let's make it a little more practical with an example, a little less abstract with an example. Uh, let's look at this example here. So uh, having a toothache is conditionally dependent on cavity. Catching a cavity is conditional, conditionally dependent on the existence of the cavity, and there is no relationship between toothache and catch. So what? If we want to calculate the probability, the joint probability of this event, uh, having a cavity, 
catching a cavity and not having a toothache, how do we do this? Well, first, what's the probability? How do we calculate the probability of X1 uh, condition on his parents? It's the probability of cavity. I'm going to represent this as plus C condition on all of its parents. Since it doesn't have any parents, it's just a probability of catching the cavity. Let me erase this. Okay. Now we have to move on to the next element. The probability of plus catch condition on its parents. So it's the probability of plus catch. I'm going to represent catch with C prime conditioned on uh, C, whether or not cavity exists or not, multiplied by the next item, which is the probability of no toothache, negative T, condition on C. And given the CPTs, the conditional probability tables of each of these nodes, all you need to do to calculate this joint probability distribution is to calculate this multiplication. Um, why are we guaranteed that setting this joint probability distribution to this multiplication results in a proper joint distribution? Well, this comes from applying the chain rule, which is valid for all distributions, with the assumption of conditional independence. So remember, X, conditional independence tells us X sub I is conditioned on X1 to X I minus one, which essentially represent the parents of X sub I. As a consequence, if you apply this uh, assumption in the chain rule, you will see that this equality always holds. Uh, essentially the topologies enforcing certain conditional independences, which allows us to, uh, to use this uh, equivalency or equation. So let's quickly look at, a, look at an example of coin flips. So these are the conditional probability tables of each node since there are no parents, we can just represent them as P of X1, P of X2, and so on. So what would be the probability of heads, heads, tails, and heads? Since we are assuming absolute independence, it will just be 0.5 multiplied by 0.5 multiplied by 0.5 multiplied by 0.5. Let's make things a little more interesting. Let's assume that we have a base net of this form for traffic. R represents raining, T represents, uh, T represents traffic. So for R, the CPT is just going to be the probability of R occurring. And we have these values in the CPT that's inside R. What about the CPT that's inside T? It's going to be the conditional probability of T condition on R. So for plus R, this is the CPT for minus R, this is the CPT. How can we calculate the probability of plus R and the negative T? So it's what's a probability, what's the corresponding value for the first one? Plus R, it's going to be the probability of plus R, condition on uh, 
its parents, the parent is R, multiplied by the probability of negative t for r. What does this come to? This is essentially the probability. This value is uh, summing the, uh, is essentially the summation of uh, I'm missing anything here. All right. This is essentially P of plus R uh, I need I need you to pitch in here. How can we decompose this? What's the probability of plus R given R? Does anybody have any thoughts or ideas on how we can do this? Note that if we just look at the sum of these two, the probability will be one. But we know that it's not always one, right? The probability of plus r occurring conditioned on r is Can you help me out? What's the definition of conditional probability? Does anybody remember the definition of conditional probability? So it's P of plus R. It is the likelihood. Um, I need a more mathematical definition. That's what I meant. Over P of R, right? So what does that translate into here? For R, uh, I'm sorry, this is, I made a mistake here. That's why I was so confused. I made a rookie mistake. I started from the reverse order. Let me start from the top. So, the very first element is whether or not it's raining. It's not whether or not it's toothache. I was mistaking R and T uh, in the beginning. The probability of uh, the first element is P of plus R given its parents. Since there are no parents for the node R, it's just going to be this probability here, one over four. multiplied by the probability of negative t conditioned on its parent, right? Conditioned on r, which is Can you tell me what this is? The assignment of R in here is plus R. So this is going to be P of negative T given plus R, which is going to be one over four, which means that the pr joint probability distribution of this event 
it's raining and it's not, there is no traffic, that's a event that's uh, is describing the probability of that event is 1 over 16. Okay, so I only have a, one more slide to go through. I'm not going to go over this example. You can do it on your own uh, for practice. Now, Remember this, this is what we just looked at. What if we were to reverse the order of causality? What if we were to say that rain is conditionally dependent on T and uh, put an edge from T to R saying that traffic is causing rain? How would that change the results? Well. P of T uh, can be calculated based on, uh, is already given to us. P of R given T can be calculated as before. One thing I want to point out here is when we, when we reverse the order of causality or these directions, when we reverse the direction of edges, the result is still going to be the same as before. So when Bayesian's reflect the true causal patterns, it's often simpler, which means that nodes have fewer, pa uh, fewer parents, often easier to think about, and they are often easier to elicit from experts because the experts uh, already know the true causal relationship. But not, but base nets do not necessarily have to be actually causal. So the edges and direction, the directions of those edges in a base net does not necessarily have to be representative of a causation or a causal relationship. Sometimes there is no causal uh, net exist. Sometimes there is just no uh, way of representing the, a particular domain with a causal base net, especially if there are some variables that you don't know about. For example, consider the variables traffic and drip in the example we looked at earlier, which essentially leads to us ending up with arrows that reflect correlation, not causation. So what do the arrows really mean? The topology may happen to encode causal structure, but what it really encodes, what the topology or the structure of the base net, the graphical model really encodes, is conditional independence, right? It's essentially representing these sort of, uh, this equivalence. When we represent something as a child of another parent or some parents, we are denoting this relationship here. All right, so we're done with the lecture today. Thank you so much for bearing with me. I'm sorry I had to rush through the last few lectures. We're gonna do a quick review of everything uh, next time. Uh, next time we're gonna talk about base net hey, inference and so on. If you have any questions, I am now at your service to answer. Vivek? Vivek, do you have a question? Do you, like after the class, is that possible? Um, sure, <laughs> if you want, I can stop, I can stop recording so that. Okay, no problem, maybe after, after the All class, right. it's just for a few minutes. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, any other questions? No, professor, thank you. All right, thank you very much.